And our next speaker is a senior expert at NATO Stratcom. Her name is Marina Vorotnitseva, and she will talk about how Russian propaganda uses local context in the EU. And she will also explain how and why Russian disinformation might differ in Sweden compared to other European countries. Welcome to the broadcast, Marina. Hello, Bjorn. Hello to your colleagues and participants. Yeah, I hear you. Where are you joining us from? Well, currently I'm in Riga, uh, and I hope that today is the first day of the real spring here. So I hope you also have a great weather. Yeah, uh, not so great, <laughs> but but doable. Uh, everything okay. everything seems to be working fine. So go ahead. Well, thank you, Bjorn. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to start from the short explanation. Uh, I'm working as a senior expert at the NATO Strategic Communications Center of Excellence. Uh, I'm a Ukrainian citizen. Um, uh, NATO Strategic Communications Center of Excellence is a multinationally constituted at NATO accredited international military organization, which is not part of the NATO common structure, not sub nor subordinate to any uh, other NATO entity. As such, the center does not speak there for, uh, for NATO, but uh, we have here in the center uh, quite significant Ukrainian expertise and understanding of Russian information and disinformation campaigns against Ukraine and against the NATO countries. So I would like to start from um, my personal um, background. I started my journalistic career in 2003 in Lugansk. This is uh, Eastern Ukrainian territory occupied since 2014. Uh, so uh, I've seen how Russian propaganda impacts the local communities in Eastern Ukraine since their early 2000s. And I've seen how propaganda rises the generations of people uh, who may be and who were used against Ukraine uh, during the invasion that Russia launched in 2014 uh, in Eastern regions of Ukraine. Uh, the main idea of Russian propaganda is in propaganda as well, is to weaponize everything that is valuable. Uh, propaganda is always offensive, hostile activity against the society in the informational sphere, but not only in informational area. Propaganda is also uh, supporting different political parties that can spread different narratives. Propaganda is always the, can use the uh, paramilitary organizations, military organizations and whatever. Uh, the main goal of Russian propaganda is uh, to undermine and to impact on the values and law uh, in a different countries and a different society. Uh, propaganda's aim to create a chaos, a chaos inside of society and to undermine the trust inside of the society, to undermine the trust to the institutions. Uh, unfortunately, this is the experience, this is the practice that I've seen in Eastern Ukrainian regions that have been occupied in 2014. Uh, propaganda uses always uses the local context and the local specifics. Uh, first thing you can see when, uh, you, when propaganda is targeting you, this is the emotions, drama. Propaganda always needs to get your attention. And the shortest way to get it is to create a drama, scandal, a conflict, or to something like that. If you'll check Russian TV shows, political TV shows uh, on the main government on TV channels, you can see that people, they're, they're not talking to each other there. They are not discussing something. They are arguing and screaming on each other. Often they are fighting there. So this is how the propaganda uh, can catch the attention, can uh, make you uh, involved in this uh, scandal, in this drama, in this emotional conflict. The second thing that propaganda does uh, is like an invention and creation and implementing the specific glossary that they're using. For instance, um, on the, in the beginning of uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine, it was said that Russia is conducting special military operation against Ukraine. Uh, in the nor normal language, it means the war, the full-scale invasion, with the hundreds of tanks, artillery, with the missile strikes in the, uh, in the apartment buildings. Uh, the another narrative that they promoted was denazification, which means aggression, war, and the aggression of war as a, as a crime in general. 
um, so the, the emotions, glossary, and the local context, which is very important. As a propaganda tool, might be used as a history, uh, different um, history, different war memories, different understanding of some historical events. Language differences, as you know, many Ukrainians understand Russian and speak Russian. And this was one of the main uh, reasons why Russia attacked Ukraine. Uh, the social frictions inside of the society, different understanding of um, religious culture, different cultures, different traditions, different customs, different cultural things. So all these may be weaponized uh, and all these may be used against the societies uh, as a propaganda tool. For instance, uh, let's see how the culture, cultural tools works in propaganda. As you know, Russian government involving many uh, singers, popular actors into supporting the propaganda and the war. Uh, first, these people... Uh, I don't know if it's the opera singers or actors. Uh, they might be famous in a different European countries. They are having their plays there, their concerts, and then they're going back to Russia and supporting the war, which is, um, and after that, th their uh, fans and their, um, yeah, the fans in European Union or in other countries in the US and wherever, they may not believe that, this uh, Russia is conducting the real uh, war in Ukraine because they cannot believe that such great actors or football play players or sportsmen they can support this horrific war. Uh, this this is so called soft power, and all these local um, tools, all these contacts may be used as a weaponization, uh, as the propaganda tool, a propaganda narrative. Um, yeah, as the Previous speakers already told fake news is just a small, very small part of propaganda because fake news, it's a things that's so easy to debunk. Um, uh, but fake news can be um, the, the, the main idea of uh, the fake news and other tools of propaganda is to create the chaos. If you don't know whom to believe, it might be concerned as a success of propaganda. Uh, Propaganda includes the fake news, manipulation, disinformation, uh, rumors, discreditation, uh, for instance, for politicians and uh, um, other famous and trusty people, uh, radicalization, and all other things is also a propaganda against of different societies, against of different social groups, against of different religious groups, um, against of, uh, I don't know, nationalities, genders, uh, whatever, traditional groups, cultural circles, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, let's let's see how it goes in in the one of the contexts, the Swedish context. This is the a screenshot from the the Guardian. Um, the text based on the official statements from the Swedish uh, government officials. What we see uh, in this campaign first, um, Russian propaganda attacks the re religion tolerance uh, of the society, values, freedom of speech, and creates the drama and emotions. Um, this is how any random event may be used uh, against the society to create a bad reputation, to create a conflict on the international area, and how to create the problems uh, and the conflicts. We have another context. Um, yeah, uh, this is also a very sensitive topic. Uh, but in Ukraine, we have the same problem, but of course, in the much bigger scale. Um, so uh, my suggestion is when we the main idea is when are we talking about this church and religious organizations? We are not saying something about the believers, about the people who goes to these churches. Mainly, we think about the organizational structure that can be used for different uh, for different aims in a very different way. Uh, so, uh, I have a few examples of how Russian propaganda attacked, uh, used the local context in European countries, uh, and were targeting Ukrainians mainly. mainly. Uh, as you know, after the invasion started, millions of Ukrainians become refugees in different um, European countries. Uh, and the Russian propaganda targeted Ukrainians in a few countries. Uh, uh, yeah, the majority of the refugees were women with kids. 
uh, and in those countries where level of uh, when the society is more religious, when uh, where more people are going to the church, then um, they are identifying themselves with some churches. Uh, this um, this thing were used to promote the, the narrative that the Ukrainian women are looking for new spouses in in the European Union. Uh, this uh, there was uh, one narrative was targeting to the religious families that considering marriage as something holy but not as a partnership. Uh, another narrative was promoting that Ukrainians only looking for uh, financial support from European countries and they they are not grateful. Uh, these narratives were based on the very unique, a few very unique cases that really happened. As the previous speaker said, yes, propaganda often used something real, but generalize it into something unreal. Uh, and uh, uh, this, the main goal of these campaigns were to attack Ukrainians in the European Union and to undermine the trust between Ukraine and different countries to break this connection on the human's level, not on the government level, but on the, the human's level, to make Ukrainians feel uncomfortable and to make local people be, uh, I don't know, uh, to, to think that the Ukrainians are maybe dangerous somehow. But of course, being a refugee and being as ADP is not something exciting. It's not that you can enjoy. Uh, for the majority of Ukrainians who become refugees in European countries, this is the huge problem. This is the disaster for a few generations uh, of the family. And this is the thing that will have emotional and psychological consequences for many, many years, especially if they were under attack of um, under informational and propagandistic attacks. The next example I would like to use, it's the uh, rumors and uh, about the corruption in Ukrainian government. Uh, there were a few large, significant campaigns on the social networks, mostly on TikTok and Telegram, uh, that were targeting uh, Ukrainian government. Um, the main idea was to discredit the Ukrainian government. Uh, for instance, um, as you know, on the 7th of October, Hamas attacked at Israel. And on, eight, on 8th of October, so the next day, uh, in anonymous Telegram channels, a few videos appeared. The video was saying the video was made um, uh, on behalf of the fake Hamas soldier, you know, the guy in Balaklava with closed face. Uh, he'd been saying, like, thank you very much, Mr. Zelensky, for delivering weapons to Hamas. Uh, and this was the attempt to involve Ukraine into Israeli Hamas conflict. It was the attempt to discredit Ukrainian government. It was and it was to at attempt to uh, share the, the information that Ukrainian government is so corrupt that is selling the weapons that have been delivered by uh, European partners and American partners uh, to the uh, Hamas. Um, this was one of the uh, main Russian efforts uh, in uh, against Ukraine in October last year. Uh, the next... The next, yes, one of the, my favorite uh, propagandistic narrative against Ukraine that been used in European countries, different European countries, depending on the context, that this is narrative about peace negotiations, that Ukraine doesn't want a peace, that Ukraine wants that someone else, whatever country, paid for the war. And then if uh, the Western partners would stop delivering weapons to Ukraine, the war will stop. This is how the typical victim blaming looks like, uh, because the Ukraine is a victim of the war. Ukraine being attacked, and uh, any uh, attempts to put the, the the responsibility on the war on Ukraine. This is the typical propagandistic narratives to reframe the war, to reframe the problem. Um, of course, Ukraine has, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if we're able to show the video, but uh, uh, anyway, photo looks very well and um, pictures the real situation. This is the Abdiivka city uh, in the eastern part of Ukraine, in the Donetsk region. Uh, a few years ago, uh, years ago, it was the 35,000 city, uh, mostly Russian-speaking people have been living there. And now the Abdiivka city looks like this. So this is what Russia calls the liberation, the denazification, 
and whatever uh, other things. Oh, yeah, and the special military operation against the Nazi government in Kiev. This is how the truth looks like. And um, yeah, I have a few minutes uh, more, and I would like to recommend you the movie. Uh, a few days ago, Ukrainian movie got the Oscar as the best documentary for last year. Oh yeah, thank you for the video. Uh, this is how the Abdivka city looks like uh, looked like in January 2022. Uh, the video made by drone. Um, uh, this is the real picture, not generated by AI. And this is the Russian Orthodox Church that was located in the uh, city downtown. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the movie, I would like to recommend you the movie. It calls 20 Days in Mariupol. Uh, it was made by Associated Press journalists. Um, they have uh, been to Mariupol uh, since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. Uh, and this is the documentary, no political comments there, no mayors, not, no government officials, no one, just a people, uh, real people, citizens that I don't know you can find such people in any city in Ukraine um, and this movie just um, the real evidence of what's going on uh, during the war what's going on when you're under attack um, but be careful please this movie will not make you feel good or will not make you feel happy and this movie is not recommended to the kids and it's not recommended to those who are under 18 years old um, so uh, this concludes my main uh, idea. So if you have any questions, Bjorn, we can uh, we can move forward. Yes, thank you so much, Marina. Uh, I have a few questions, but the time is short. Um, but let me first start off with when we were advertising this event and people saw that you were coming uh, to join us as a speaker. Some people proposed that you would speak on behalf of NATO and also that you would give us a one-sided propaganda of the West, quotation. What's your comment on that? And also, how does NATO Stratcom work with the issues of trust, transparency and truth? Well, uh, thank you, Bern. Uh, first of all, I'm not speaking on behalf of NATO, as I told in the beginning. Uh, but uh, NATO Stratcom Center of Excellence uh, research the informational environment um, to understand what's going on there, um, what's the perspectives and how is trends going to develop in the future. <clears throat> we have the expertise in understanding how the informational environment is operated, structured, who is doing what, especially Russia. And my personal um, sphere of expertise and sphere of understanding is how Russia attacks Ukraine, mostly because I'm a Ukrainian citizen, of course, and this is one of the mine um, my priorities and my points of interest. Um, how about uh, transparency, yes, and, and the balance of, of opinion? Um, mostly, uh, uh, like for now, the main uh, goal, the main, of, uh, the main aim of Ukraine is to deliver uh, the information that is, might be, um, well, um, it's not a controversial, but it's more about the, the real information. That's why Ukraine is so open to the journalists, to the filmmakers, to whatever people that are interesting to get the, um, the, the real situation, the real information. Um, from my personal experience, I've never seen uh, such a level of open and, exp and publicly and open uh, uh, publicly availability from the government official. Um, and of course, uh, uh, being transparent and being understandable uh, for for the world is uh, one of the Ukrainian uh, achievements for the last two years. Unfortunately, in such context, but uh, we saw how this uh, informational transparency helps Ukraine uh, to bring the truth into the information into the international uh, media and uh, platforms. Thank you for clarifying. Um, I also want to ask you if you see any change in conflicts and real-life events that are being used as a basis for propaganda uh, now and for, say, uh, the time before Russia's invasion of the Crimean Peninsula, annexation, I, I should say. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
for the last few years, we've noticed a few uh, important things that may be useful for uh, in other countries for, for our partners. This is the first thing. This is the um, uh, using of anonymous source of information. As you know, in Ukraine, the Telegram uh, is one of the most popular source of getting information. 75% of Ukrainians are using Telegram as a news source. And Russia operates there. They're establishing so-called anonymous sources, Telegram channels. You know, mostly they're based on the conspiracy theories and rumors and uh, whatever fake news. But uh, people usually like this conspiracy theories. There are some part of uh, population that very addicted to these stories and rumors and insights and leaks from the governments. Uh, they uh, they were quite successful in building networks of such anonymous sources, but now most of them are debunked and discredited in Ukraine. So Ukrainians, um, my my understanding is that uh, now Ukrainians have uh, a higher level of media literacy than we have a, um, earlier before. And the second thing is using the AI-generated videos, like deepfakes, AI-generated video, videos and photos that have, that have been spreading on the social networks, uh, TikTok, Facebook mostly. Um, to The main uh, aim of these deepfake videos is first to uh, forward the subscribers or the viewers to the anonymous Telegram channels. Second thing, to collect the personal data of uh, Ukrainians for you for targeting in the future, and the third thing is to discredit uh, the um, uh, senior military commanders, uh, especially for the last maybe year, maybe eighteen months. We've noticed uh, a few deepfakes with a quite good quality that been made to discredit the military commanders because. For obvious reasons, uh, Ukrainian you know, military commanders for now are the most trustable and uh, persons in, in the country. So not only new conflicts, but also new techniques such as collecting data, personal data and the use of generative uh, AI. Yeah. Yeah. One final question. In your opinion, what can we expect from Russian propaganda before the EU elections? Uh, do you see anything in particular in your work? Well, I think they're gonna use the experience that have that they have in Ukraine uh, in the other different countries. Um, that's why uh, I mean the AI generated video, the defects generated with AI. Uh, so this is why it's so important for all European countries to build. Um, uh, well, in Ukraine, the military commanders, um, they are very public persons. And if you see something about the, the military commanders or the political leadership on a social networks, it's very easy to check if this information is real. You can go to the official public face, uh, um, Facebook page, you can go to official website, you can go whatever and check the information. But a few years ago, uh, Ukrainian military commanders and the the head of local administrations, they were not so publicly available. They were, they have, they had not this um, public pages accounts. That was not so easy to find information about them. So what the lessons that we learned is that all heads of public, um, the, the all heads of the government, the ministers, the military commanders, they should be, they must be presented on the social media. They have to be public persons. It creates this transparency in the line of trust between the, the um, officials and the, the people, which helps the people, and this helps people to check any information that can appear in their Facebook feed or TikTok feed or uh, whatever. Information should be easy to check. This is the, the main thing. So this is the, uh, to, uh, according to European elections, this is the same thing. You uh, European politicians should be publicly presented and it would be easy to check uh, if they said something or not saying because spreading the rumors and fake news this is one of the most uh, popular tools of Russian propaganda especially on the social networks. Thank you so much for joining us today Marina. I hope you have a nice time in the warm spring weather that you have. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.